Welcome to the Wave Podcast. We tell the stories of life. In 2017, world music revenues were estimated at some 17.3 billion United States dollars, excluding concerts. Africa accounted for just 2% of these global revenues, even though the continent is bursting with talent, some of it already visible at the international level. With approximately 60% of the population under the age of 25, and the penetration of smartphones, as well as the multiplication of music streaming platforms, Africa could potentially be the new territory to conquer in this particular value chain. Whether it be Nigerian Afrobeats, South African Kweto, Angolo Kuduro, Congolese Ndombolo, Ivorian Coupe de Calais, or Ghanaian Shaku Shaku, Africa offers different and new sounds that make the whole world dance. Sounds that have become a source of inspiration for many celebrities. To give some examples, P. Diddy produced the latest album of Burner Boy entitled Twice As Tall. The Gift, the Lion King album produced by Beyonce's Parkwood Entertainment, is almost exclusively filled with sounds from Africa. Ladi Poe's first smash single, Know You, featuring Nigerian singer Simi, peaked at number one in Nigeria in 2020. During the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, the music industry was hit hard the world over, with live performance revenues being the biggest casualty. According to the World Economic Forum, the shutdown is estimated to have cost the industry more than 10 billion United States dollars in sponsorships alone. Evidence also shows that the way people listen to music has changed in the light of COVID-19. More consumers use home applications on televisions and smart devices. As a consequence, American and European artists, for example, have found new ways to monetize music consumption through the use of live stream performance. There are few examples of this happening in Africa. Generally, the overall behavior in Africa is different. As in Europe and America, it is expected that revenues from live streaming will grow as indicated earlier. However, it is unlikely that this business model can be applied to African listeners in a sustainable manner in the short term because the cost of and access to the internet remains beyond the reach of most on the continent. Beyond this, the private sector sponsorship model is suffering also because most sponsors have cut the marketing budgets that would normally have been dedicated to the music industry. This means that artists cannot even rely on advertising deals to bridge the shortfall in their earnings. The question therefore is, what is the sustainable business model that African record labels, music platforms and artists can adopt to counter the economic effects of the pandemic? There is a further problem. Emerging talents have clearly been having difficulties since the start of the pandemic in finding record labels to represent their interests given, in large part, the lack of available resources. If this continues, it will surely have a massively negative impact on the future of the African music industry which, if it is to survive and continue to grow, needs to be able continuously to nurture its retinue of fresh sounds and new talents so it can remain relevant on the global market. What then is the way forward? We are the way we reaching out to the skies Africa rising Moving like on its stars We are the way we tell the stories of life We tell the stories of life discussing um, how African music industry is taking off um, after exploding on dance across the world. 
how Afrobeats, um, the exciting sound emerging from West Africa, has entered the global music's consciousness, and most importantly, how to develop a strong market at home. My name is Charlotte Buana. Uh, I am Kenyan with over five years experience in the music industry. I am currently the head of business development and media partnerships for Ojomac in Africa. Ojomac is an American youth driven um, artist first music streaming platform that provides artists with a platform to effortlessly share their music and provides listeners and the world um, an, an amazing listening experience that is focused on discovery and exploration. With me today, I am very pleased uh, to host this episode of The Wave um, and, you know, just talk about um, the African music industry and its takes on, on the global market. I'm delighted to have with me um, a, a, a good panel, you know, strong panel. So just to introduce them, Frank Kaku, um, the Francophone Ivorian um, who heads uh, Universal Music Africa. He's also recently launched Def Jam Africa, yay, uh, popularly known as Black Kent. Um, he was a singer, songwriter, and rapper prior to joining Universal Africa. Welcome, Frank. Thank you, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, the second person I have is Valentine, Valentin Gaudin, the managing director of Trace Southern Africa with over 10 years of experience in the entertainment in, and television industry. Valentin is in charge of driving the strategies for the trace operations in Anglophone and Lusophone Africa, which includes marketing, communication, digital platforms, sales, TV, um, TV channels, and programming. Trace is the leading youth media brand in sub-Saharan Africa and the number one global brand of Afro-urban entertainment. Welcome, Valentin. Thank you so much for having me. And last but not least uh, is the Nigerian singer and rapper, Ladi Po, Ladi Po in the building. Are you down? <laughs> down, <laughs> get it. <laughs> <laughs> Ladi Po rose to prominence with the release of the song Feel All Right, um, in which he was featured by SBC Show Them Camp. Um, and then released Are You Down, featuring Tio Savage in 2018. He was the first rapper to be signed to Don Jazz's Maven record label. And during the COVID-19 lockdown in 2020, Ladipo went ahead to drop his hit single, Know You, featuring Simi, that became an international internet sensation on social media. And he recently won a heady three days ago. Congratulations, Ladipo. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was fun. All need to have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Right. Um, so to jump right into it, um, I think I'm going to start by asking everybody, how has the, uh, the pandemic affected the, um, your business? Um, so I, I don't really know of any business that hasn't been affected by this global pandemic unless you are a company called Zoom, <laughs> if you're selling essential COVID-19 supplies. Uh, but I think we've managed to make it through the crisis because we have a fairly stable business model. Uh, but this, this crisis has forced us to accelerate the digital transformation that we started working um, a few years ago. So it, COVID has definitely fast-tracked this project. Um, we really want to position Trace as the number one brand empowerment brand for youth and creators. So right now we have 27 TV channels, 200 digital radios, seven FM radios, five mobile and digital platforms. So we really want to be established as the signature brand on Afro-urban cultures and youth empowerment. So a few projects that we are about to launch actually is Trace Academia. So it's a free innovative online learning platform and employment ecosystem. So we offer courses dedicated to jobs, entrepreneurship and soft skills, and it's a free, completely free platform. So it's a an advertising funded model or partners, uh, or we, we have partnerships to launch this platform. And the goal is to empower 25 million youth by 2025. And very important, because I'm really pro-woman, including at least 50% women. And I think this, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, and then we also have a platform called Trace Plus, a paid uh, entertainment platform for Afro urban music uh, in culture. So it's got all the trace channels available, radio and some VOD content. So I think overall, um, it's been, a, I, won't, I won't say a good thing, but it's, it's really pushed us to 
reinvent ourselves and accelerate that digital transformation. Bad to jump, bad to jump behind that. Um, of course, it was um, it was a tough year. 2020 was a tough year for us. Um, as far as our business model uh, on this side of Africa, as you may know, uh, streaming hasn't been the thing yet over here. So uh, the business model and the and, and around 50% of the revenue mostly comes from shows and venues and concerts. So when you close a country for eight to nine months, you can imagine how hard it can be for um, producers, whether they're a major company on the continent or indie labels. So it was a tough year, but as uh, Valentin said, um, it created new needs as well for, for our different partners. Like um, the brands need, still needed to communicate. Um, consumers still needed to have music. And artists somehow um, became more creative, innovative, um, the digital transformation hit everyone. Uh, it was like last year was truly an accelerator in terms of digital um, uh, uh, initiatives on that part of the continent. So uh, it also opens um, other, other type of conversations with strong partners, including telephone operators, for instance, who were searching for digital content and content creative content, premium content coming from these artists. And it actually helped us like balance uh, that part of uh, what we lost from the business and read, read events, also um, the live experience. And we'll talk about it later, I guess, as well. So it was like, you know, I won't say 50-50, I'll say 60-40 um, of um, having been hit hard and 40% of it being like an opportunity for the next few years. Makes perfect sense. Um, Ladi Paul. Uh, yes, definitely. You know, the, 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 it's obvious the similarities here is the fact that it was a tough time and it, it took a lot of adjusting to the, what is people have been calling the new normal, you know, because aside from there being a loss in shows, um, which is obviously a significant income stream on this side of the world. It was also the deciding how to create music, how I wanted to approach that. And that I found that a little bit difficult at the time, you know, because um, mentally just under grasping what is going on around me didn't immediately spur on my creative my creativity, in fact, it hampered it. it. It caused me to really struggle to write. I didn't know what I wanted to talk about. I didn't, there were so many things, you know, entering my, my mental space. And I really think that um, I had to rise to the occasion when it came to that. Also, it's the duality is very interesting for me because the, the lockdown was very hard, you know, um, in, in, in the mental and creative space. But at the same time, I released a song that the lockdown also in a sense assisted in its rise because people were looking for music. They were looking for things. And in fact, the reason why I released Know You was I felt that in this time of social distancing, you know, we couldn't afford to be emotionally distant. And that was really the concept behind the release of that song. So it, 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 it was a way for me to communicate how I was feeling at the time. And I'm just really happy that people connected with it, you know, but ultimately like, you know, he, Frank mentioned something very interesting, which is it was an, like an accelerator. You're forced to think of what to do and how can you make this uh, work. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to ever say there was anything really bad, I mean, good about this, but it did provide some very interesting points and interesting and high, high points, let me put it like that. I mean, we, we don't want to say, yeah, COVID-19, thank you for coming. But I, I mean, we've seen some, some positivity. Um, yeah. uh, Valentin, I, I wanted to say, I'm looking at data. And one of the things that I've seen that has really, really changed is how, um, 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 you know, we, we became video first and, and screen first more than audio. And I just wanted to know how, you know, how you guys made that, you know, because you did mention that you had a lot of programs that kind of just COVID-19 kind of just accelerated you launching those programs. And I, I really want to speak just a little bit more about that and how just being that, you know, people were at home and were, they had time to a lot, watch a lot more TV than they usually 
uh, do and how that worked out for you? Yeah, so I think um, the, the ratings part, um, the COVID had obviously a very good effect on our ratings. I think you can see there was a 20% increase in the, in the viewership across all our channels, but it, was, it also pushed us to think creatively. Okay, now that people are at home, we need to create special programming for them. You know, like how do we make sure people can't go to the club anymore? How do we, make sure we entertain them? So again, it's really an accelerator of ideas and concept and production. Luckily, um, we fall under what they call here essential services because we are in the media group. So we were still allowed to shoot. And I think artists were so desperate to create content with us and earn some kind of an income. So we came up with a show called House of Trace which is uh, pretty much a live DJ session that we shoot live performances that we, we shoot with artists. So we played that show um, over the weekend so that people you know, could get a bit of a party going when they were sitting at home. But yeah, it had a positive impact on the ratings, but it's a, it's a dual situation because you have high ratings, but then advertisers didn't have money to spend on the channels, which is the first in the history of television. You know. <laughs> You have all these viewers, but you have no advertiser who want to spend money on the channel. So, yeah, interesting times. Yeah, because I'd, I'd imagine nobody's going to come and say, buy clothes, but where are we going? <laughs> and where are we going? And also in South Africa, I'm not sure, I don't think in Ivory Coast or in Nigeria it was the same, but we had an alcohol ban in South Africa. And the alcohol industry is a big spender. Yeah, frankly, like, no. So it, it had a huge impact, you know. Um, a lot of the music and lifestyle shows are, are, are sponsored by alcohol brands. And they have no one to sell to. They're not allowed to sell to anyone. And this was for months. So we had the, the alcohol ban. Then they let it go. And then they implemented it again. So now the, the advertisers are really hesitant to invest again because we might get another ban if there's like a third wave. So we're kind of like in a vicious circle at the moment. Well, the South African government, you know, they should have known that we have nothing else to do. <laughs> um, Frank, just to go uh, to, to you, um, you, you did speak about, um, you know, artists getting more creative. And, um, and, and so just to ask, like, did, and, and you have two record labels, it's the mu uh, Universal Music and Def Jam, and as a head of, you know, powerful record labels, um, and how are you able to select artists or how are you watching artists in order to, to get that new signee? And especially now that they had to, to get more creative, were you seeing something different that you know you probably wouldn't see without the pandemic? Mm. Well, first of all, um, as uh, Valentin said, uh, I think that as major actors, we, we, we are, we, I, I mean, I am on a mission. I believe we, we, we have responsibility. So when, when something like this happens, we, can, we, we cannot just like, you know, pull the brakes and just wait for stuff to, to, to go. We need to, to, to help um, structure the whole thing and, and work with other artists and other indie labels to keep, keep the whole thing flowing. So we have to find a way uh, uh, besides studying risks, business risks, we had to find a way to still um, be a platform for creators, right? So, of course, um, when I got appointed uh, MD of Universal Music Africa last year, um, me coming from like having a hip hop background, it was it was supposed like we were supposed to go at um, the, this movement that we're all seeing around hip hop and um, having uh, an ANR DNA. A more precise in our DNA um, towards artists was a solution to me. So we created um, Dev Jam Africa. We worked on compilations. We had uh, weekly platforms on which um, indie rappers could come and perform uh, each and every Friday. So that helped us scout uh, more precisely and see how people like react to this and that 16, this and that performance. So that was one way like like creating programs bi-weekly or weekly programs um, had us and helped us go towards talents and offer talents a, 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 another platforms to express themselves. That was the first thing. And then um, 
by trying to respond to new needs coming from partners, we created a couple of programs and one of them was really a, uh, one of our like one of our top highlight moments um, last year, we created a digital talent show, which was like a live stream, full live stream um, talent show. Once a week, we received um, almost 3000 videos of candidates who just wanted to perform in front of um, heads of labels, heads of ARs, in front of other artists from the label. So for two months straight, each and every Saturday, there were um, eight artists who just came and performed. And at the end of this competition online, which was totally live stream and totally online, we had the chance to, fight, to, 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 to sign uh, four artists. And four artists were actually um, in, the, in the label right now. And if it wasn't for this situation, if it wasn't for COVID-19, if it wasn't for this this global thing that hit us hard, we wouldn't be able to um, adapt and create a new way to connect with the people, connect with the artists, and help the artists connect with their audience. So, um, creating programs, creating platforms, and jumping on opportunities was really a way to stay agile and, and adapt yourself to the new normal. Well, allow me to just say congratulations on your four new signings. We look forward to what they have to put out there. Um, that's just amazing what you did because I feel like in this side of the world, there's a lot of potential. Uh, you know, Africa is full, 54 countries and 60% and of those people are youth. And it's just amazing to, to see the kind of talent we have and in the kind of different genres that, that we have. And everybody just kind of just needs that opportunity yeah. To, to sit in front of record label heads or just to be heard and to be introduced to their audience. Um, speaking about creativity and and uh, Ladipo, I'm just going to move to you and we're going to talk about um, about um, Know You and the Know You Challenge specifically because I feel like that was definitely a catalyst for just shooting up the, the song and kind of just um, putting it out there for more people to to listen to. And um, I just want to talk about this short video platform. So the trailers and the TikToks and, and oh. we've seen a lot of Nigerian artists um, investing and influencing and in influencer marketing via this, you know, these platforms. And I just want to know what you think of them as a pro promotional tool with regards to, you know, the impact that these platforms had on, on your song with Simi. I think these, these platforms are indispensable now. I think that uh, it just like with anything else, it's about accessibility. I have music and I have an audience I want to reach. And it's no longer about just putting it in one place. Just same thing with when um, I put my music on a platform, uh, whether it's Spotify, where I want it to be as many places as possible. TikTok, uh, Trilla just offer me another medium, another avenue to do that. And it's crazy because we did. I did something on Trilla, which is cool. It was nice, and a bunch of people did theirs too, and it did really well on Trilla. But the the TikTok challenge was crazy, and the duet feature really worked for Know You. Know You is essentially somebody saying, "I really want to tell you how my day went, but I don't know you that well." And the duet feature is these two people who are in separate places having a conversation through the lyrics of the song. I mean, it just didn't get much better than that. And once I decided that that's what I wanted to do, and Simi and I did it, it was crazy how it took off you know um, before that the song was steadily climbing up the chart so i'm very i'm very grateful to these platforms but at the same time it's you still get to impose your creativity on the situation and you still have to come up with the ideas learn a new software new tool become proficient at it and and if you're lucky you will watch it go i just think as an artist your type your style your personality, your medium, whatever music you make, there are tools out there that suit that thing. It's up to you to put them together because I'm all about creating content. I'm a very visual artist. I'm a rapper, I'm a songwriter, and it's about clarity for me. It's about the things that I say and how can people understand what I'm trying to say, you know? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate and I, I use what I had at my, at my disposal well. I am glad you did because I, I feel like that's the, the one thing that I really, really saw. I, I saw 
there's uh, people just doing this challenge in Kenya, in Mauritius, in in. It's Chicago. crazy. It was so wow. crazy. But I was like essentially like really really happy just to see that because also I'm just like a huge fan of the song. Um, guys, we're gonna move on to let's let's talk about live stream now. During the lockdown in 2020, uh, there's a company it's called uh, Ban Ban Sin Town that estimated that about 60,905 live streams took place between March 25th and December 12th. But of this 60,000, there were very few. If, if none, um, African artists doing these live streams, right? So for me, I think my question is, why is it that African artists uh, uh, did not do these live streams, did not hold a Pan-African virtual uh, event? I think we only saw one, which was Africa Day with MTV. Um, and, 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 if, and, and, and what do we do to move forward? How do we make this a thing um, where we can have a, a virtual Pan-African concert? Um, my question, Frank. Um, I mean, they did. Artists did have like live stream shows, um, as far as um, French speaking Africa, right? But um, you mentioned um, like pan, being Pan African, which is like a Pan African show, which is which is which is a very huge and complicated thing. Um, we did we did work on one with Canal Plus, you know, the, the, with Canal Plus, we, we worked on a program called Africa at Home, but it was mainly French speaking huge artists and, and, uh, and actors. Uh, so it was mainly Pan-African, but Francophone Pan-African. Um, I think that um, if it, it wasn't the case or it hasn't been the case yet, because we're still trying to find a way to build bridges between these different parts of Africa. So imagine people from outside the continent see the continent as one, one global one thing where it's multiple languages, cultures, um, sounds uh, from a country to another. Like we are next to Ghana and we look nothing like the Ghanaian sounds, but there's ins there are inspirations, but the day to day is not really the same. So we um, and artists and actors and even you guys at Audio Mac and DSPs, etc. We have a responsibility to build these bridges between these artists and cultures and and link them up. Artists usually are curious about the fact that okay, well, you're in Cote d'Ivoire. I'm in Nigeria. How does it work out there? Whenever we pop up, oh, you 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 got Coupe de Calais, or you got a different type of Afro beats, or oh, you guys got Alte. What is Alte? It sounds good. How does it work? So we're still in 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 the building of all that, and I think that it actually made it more complicated it, during that time to to like builds like you know link these worlds. People had their live shows. Artists had their live shows for their audience or their countries or their part of the continent. But we still needed. I think that we need. We still need to work on the fact that we can bring like top and medium artists from, from Nigeria, top and medium and low-key artists from SA, top and medium and low-key artists from Cote d'Ivoire, et cetera, to have them on one single platform. For instance, we haven't been able to have a global tour from a major African artist. This is something that Ladipo, for instance, I, I'm sure that he would love to like hop on a show jump from Senegal to Cote d'Ivoire and then Ghana and then Cameroon and jump back to Nigeria and USA and Kenya, but it's not that easy. So we still need to work on how to, to merge these things. And then we'll have our own Pan-African, Anglophone, Francophone, Arabic um, uh, uh, show. So there's still work to do. <laughs> well, um, makes sense. Uh, I, I was, was going to say, um, do you think collaborations, you know, just to start off would help, you know, just like having Ladipo collaborate with Fully Pupa or something like that um, as a beginning? Um, okay. Ladipo, I'm looking forward to that collaboration, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. I'm sorry. Uh, Valentin, let's talk about, you know, so I, I, I want to pose the same question to you um, yeah. about, you know, we saw uh, an Africa Day uh, virtual concert done by MTV. Um, we I think also did one. 
with the yeah. African Union yeah. <laughs> on the same day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, then. Yeah. No, I, I think for me, um, it boils down to investment that, you know, because those uh, live streaming across multiple countries are expensive if you want to do it well to the quality, at least I would expect it to see on a trace channel. So I think no one was really willing to make that investment without seeing some kind of return on investment. We all know many runs the world, guys. <laughs> um, and I think for usually this kind of collaborative um, concerts and performances are funded and spo sponsored by brands. And I go back to my point earlier, a lot of the brands that sponsor this kind of contents are alcohol lifestyle brands. And we had a concept. We had the green light from a really big um, um, alcohol brand, I, I can't name it, but then with all the restrictions in the different countries and mainly in ASA, which, was, which is one of their major markets, they had to pull the plug. So I think for me, it really boils down to, yeah, to an in, in investment. Um, yeah, but we had, we really wanted to do that because uh, America did it, um, Europe, there's been a lot of, you know, live streaming performances. And also one of the major barriers, is the cost of data in this country. I, I know in Kenya, it's a lot cheaper than in South Africa, but I don't know of anyone who would go buy uh, bundles to watch a live performance for a couple of hours. You know, so the African Union Partnership for Africa Day, um, it was not a live, uh, we, it was pre-recorded and then broadcasted, packaged and then broadcasted on our channels across the continent because I feel that we would reach a wider audience than doing a live stream where this, I think on the continent, people are still shy to, you know, use their, their own data to watch live concerts because of the cost, you know. Um, Unless, and what we've found that works in Kenya, for instance, we done a few trace live concerts with Salty Soul, for instance, and we zero rated the data with Safaricom to make sense for our users to actually watch the performance and not pay a cent. So there are options, but it, I think it's still early stages and it really boils down to investment. Love to hear it. Safaricom are doing amazing in Kenya. You guys did amazing as well with Salty Soul. Um, Ladipo, I'm going to go with the same question, but with a different angle as a, you know, from a creative perspective, I know a lot of artists just, you know, get the energy and the excitement from being on stage and being able to jump and being able to tell their fans, put your hands up and, you know, yeah. and everybody just screaming their name. And it's completely different from just doing a live concert where it's just you and the band and, you know, sometimes you just, you don't have the energy then, and how did you deal with that? And what, what, how do you feel about live streams? I know you, you can't wait to get back on stage, but. I, you know, the, the two best parts about what I do is writing the music and making the music. I love that. And, but the icing on the cake is performing it. I can't describe to you the feeling of stepping on stage and there's however many thousands of people or, you know, 10 to 15, whatever number out there waiting to see you. The energy transfer is, I can't describe it. You know, so it's been something I've missed so much. I haven't performed Know You before on stage. And that to me is, is major. I can't wait to do that. That performance, I promise you, you need to be there to be a shutdown. But that, that has been um, tough. It's been a tough thing to get my, uh, wrap my head around that concept. Live performances, the, um, performance in the studio is cool the the because as an artist you you love your music so the energy is still there but it's definitely not the same thing um and i agree completely what valentine is saying in and sorry i can't pronounce it properly but it, it's it really boils down to the investment and i really want to see more people doing this because on a small scale certain artists would take it upon themselves my label mate johnny drill he had his own thing what he did was he pre-recorded it and then broadcast it live you know, but these are the things he's willing to do. He's willing to take his own resources, label resources to put into this, to say, I want to do this for his audience, but I really want to see it on a bigger scale. I was, I did the uh, Africa Together thing. I think it was um, Red Cross and Facebook. I did Hope for Africa, which was um, one Africa foundation. They did that and they broadcasted a multi-choice. I was, I was part of those two things and it was 
fun, but it was all pre-recorded. There's still a lot of work to be done to give audiences a quality experience, but really where's the money coming from? And I saw a lot of people not wanting to go that far. I really, when I perform, I really like to put everything into it. And I feel like my partners, the business partners, the people that I bring in the money should really also have that level of um, commitment to it, but the numbers are not adding up. And I can understand that even though I'm a creative, I understand fully that there's still a lot of work to be done there. So I would love to see those gaps filled. You know, there are certain platforms that reached out where we've created the content, we put it on ourselves to put the content but then maybe later on they pull out or don't involve themselves anymore. You know, it's, it's, uh, there's a number of stakeholders and everybody's willing, but how committed are you to, to see it uh, pull through? So there's a lot of work to be done all around. I miss performing. Can you tell? For sure, I can tell. And definitely I'm going to be there when you perform No You for the first time. I mean, I'm in Nigeria, so I'll be there for sure. Um, um, and uh, at, 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 we spoke about cost of data, Valentin, you mentioned it, Frank, you mentioned it. And I'm just going to say, and, and I'm going to go into that. And um, I, I think Alliance um, once said for affordable data internet, it shows that um, one GB of data costs about 8% um, of income on average in, in the continent, within the continent of, of Africa. And I think this was compared to, to about 2% in Asia, cost of data is like 2% um, income, right? And so we kind of know that we do, for, 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 for people to start streaming even more, we do know that we need as much collaborations with the telco industry as possible. And for the longest time, they've been doing their own thing. Um, and Frank, this goes to you at 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 a point of from point of um, 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 a record label. Are you guys speaking to this um, to these telcos? Um, you know, finding solutions for this. I'd I'd like to hear that. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely, we are uh, because I think it it'll be a game changer for everybody, like all of us out here. <laughs> it will definitely be a game changer because. They, like this is where they get their margin from data uh, as we speak. And we've, you know, I was, I was actually an artist in France and I, I experienced the, the, the shift from when uh, telcos in France decided, like, decided to, to offer uh, like low uh, rates bundle, including uh, streaming platforms uh, because they were, one new telephone op operator called Free back then who came in and just like shook up the world with crazy low rates and, and, and monthly fees. And it just helped the industry get to the era we're in right now. I think that um, the day will shift to this type of structure. Um, artists in France or in the UK or in, in the US will look at um, the continent and our markets the way our artists today look at their markets like the major full opportunity with like the frank frank Fund africa today is for 50 hundred million people this is seven times friends so the day they'll get access to music and artists will definitely get the money from how their music is being listened to the I mean, the game would just shift. Everything would just shift. So we're having discussions. They are hard because they still, they still hold, holding the dices, but they're looking for content. They need content because if like there's so many different actors that if they if they want to jump from like to still be competitive, they need content. So this is where we become as one artists, creators, um, producers this is where we become stronger and stronger because they need content and the people need content. And if the day they'll understand, they're getting to understand that. And I think that we'll jump into that pool in the next three, four, five years. Um, Valentin, is something like this happening in South Africa? And I just want to point out, uh, because Frank did mention one telco that did something amazing in France. And I think I was reading about India as well. And there's one telco called Geo that just came on board and, and 
you know, they were able to give low data on, on for everyone that had, a, you know, a geo line. And when Netflix got to India, they directly went to geo. They, they had, they didn't look at anyone else. And, you know, India, they're about as populated as the entire continent. And I think the difference between us and India is that it's one country, whereas we're a continent with 54 different um, country, 54 different countries. And obviously we have different telco players in the market and everybody is, uh, you know, in want something in return for something. So I, I'd like to know what's happening in South Africa. I, I think because South Africa, to me, if I am not wrong, is the fourth most expensive when it comes to data in the world. That's like, whoa. Yeah, it's crazy. No, so it's, it's in our roadmap. We've actually, um, and it's in our roadmap for South Africa, but for all the different, what we call clusters, for all the different head of regions, we started working with Safaricom in for Eastern Africa because I think they own 70, 70 or 80 percent of the market. We are engaging with the major players in SA that very often have a pan African decision making. Um, so we are working with Vodacom, NTN. We are also working with handset manufacturer to have either a trace app embedded on the Samsung phones or the smartphones. Um, so yeah, we are actively working with telcos uh, on our side um, because to your point, Frank, they need content, they need our help, you know, so that's another way for us to monetize our content. And I'm not talking, because Frank is going to look at me, I'm not talking about music videos and uh, content from, from, uh, from an artist's perspective, it's content that we own and that we produce and that we distribute and monetize through them. Uh, and then going back to the live um, element, on Trace Plus that is relaunching in May, we will have a live feature where people could uh, join in and, and watch a live streaming concert. And the idea is to do more of those partnership with the telcos to zero rate the data. Uh, but in South Africa, currently there's a lot of offers where uh, telcos have partnered with Netflix and they offer bundles, you know, um, 20 gigs for X amount of money. Um, and they do the same with most of the players. So the Showmax, which is the South African version of, you know, of Netflix, um, I like to call it. So that's definitely a key priority for us. Um, you know, we, the linear TV business is quite stable, but we understand this is where the consumption of content, not just music, is going. So it's, it's definitely on our roadmap and um, yeah, it definitely a priority for us. I mean, speaking about, you know, content, and you did mention that you're not looking at Frank about, you know, the artist content, but I like to, to you know, to speak about that and just like, I, I think a lot of African artists are, are have, have a lot of issues having just to deal with copyright issues. Um, and, you know, TV and radio, they're very popular just in terms of distributing artist content. And, you know, Frank, how do you manage to protect this this interest, the interest of your artists when it comes to just copyright and revenues and, you know, showing their content. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, if I, if I said that it was easy, <laughs> I would lie. Uh, we are lacking transparency to be, to be honest, as far as, um, French West Africa is concerned, we're lacking transparency. Um, we, we've been struggling with local collecting societies as far as, uh, protecting uh, our artists' rights. But the last couple of years, I'll say, um, helped us create a more uh, close relationship, a closer relationship with, with those. And last year, uh, we were able to have some of these societies um, provide advances of royalty, um, um, uh, of royalties to, to the artists. Um, uh, that were the, the that was subscribed to 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 their uh, collecting society. So we are heading there. There's still a lot to do and a lot to be done in terms of knowing the business globally as well, because some of these uh, collecting societies are still um, struggling as far as the, the the tools they have to collect information. So there's a lot to do and there's still a lot to be done. So this transparency doesn't always come from their will not to, to share information. Sometimes they just don't have these informations. So, so there's a pool of artists who get what they're supposed to get and sometimes get more. And then there's another 
who the artists don't really understand. So I think that formation and uh, information is also um, uh, at stake in here. So we're heading there, but there's still a lot to do. Uh, Valentin, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, just throw the same question at you because from it, it, this affects like TV and radio and, you know, how consumption generally. And I, I just wanna know what your, what from your perspective should be done in terms of just TV and radio, just to ensure that, you know, everybody's eating off their, their creative work and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, on our side, we have um, um, a master agreement with SESEM and in their turn, they have agreements with local collecting society. So I think it's, um, you know, so I think we're playing our part, um, but then the, like Frank's mentioned, there's issues definitely within the countries with the collecting societies. I know um, in Nigeria, for instance, I've heard of three different ones, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's a big issue. And I think the way it's currently being done is to be completely relooked. I don't have the solution. I, I get asked these questions very often. Um, all I can say is, and very proudly that we do the right thing for the artist. We do not use any you know, artist music um, without either licensing or paying for it or, you know, so yeah, I, it's, it's a big problem and there's a big education part that needs to be done. A lot of people don't know how to register and get paid for the music. So I'm um, from a South African perspective, uh, Samro and Risa and Capital, which are the, you know, the three main collecting society, they are doing quite a lot of workshops for to educate people. It's because it's quite complicated. It's very complex. Like if you were asked to ask me to explain it in a nutshell, it's very complex, you know. Um, and then you deal with like the broadcaster here who are still filling in their log forms like on a piece of paper. Then someone needs to capture everything. So like the reporting also becomes an issue. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a big problem. But I think you don't have this issue then uh, with digital. It's a lot more straightforward, you know, because you can see how many streams you had, how many, um, you know. So it, it's, I don't have the solution I wish I had. Um, yeah. um, you'd be surprised that we deal with it as well. Um, I think we speak to Capasso every day as well. So you'd be surprised. Um, Ladipo, I'm, the same question, we're still going to talk about this, but from an artist's perspective, especially coming from Nigeria, where I know that it's a different ballgame altogether. Um, and I think when it comes to Nigeria, nobody cares about IP rights or anything. I, I really want to know what you and your team and, and the entire Maven um, would like to see happen um, when it comes to just IP rights and protection. To be honest, I'll just keep it simple because a lot has already been said about it. And I'm really at the point where I just can't understand where, how if you play my music somewhere, I am not earning from it. it. It The concept blows my mind. You know, we have Coast over here has been, um, it, they have significant issues when it comes to collating the information reporting the information and they definitely have issues with paying out you know so i know that that those are ongoing battles um with my own team what we are trying to do is the things that are within our power when it comes to people licensing our work for maybe netflix and all these kind of things that we get what is due i on my own end i, I haven't yet signed a publishing deal i've been being very um picky uh and trying to find the best situation for myself because i more than anything I want a team that's around me that believes in what I do, that will go the extra mile. Because coming from this part of the world, um, everybody's in it for them. Not to say this in a derogatory way, but everybody has their own agenda. And if you don't have your own unit that is there to fight for you as an artist, absolutely, in a, re in a, in a region where income streams are already strained, you will find yourself fighting for pennies. You know, so um, what I'm trying to do is create the team around me that is is completely 100% on the lookout when it comes to my music. Um, I can't say what Maven is doing on a on a on a larger scale. You know, that that's kind of them. I'm speaking about my own unit within the label, my own management team going forward. You know, as an artist, I'm, my eyes are firmly on how can I ensure that, that all my income streams are wide as possible and uh, as open as possible. So it's a big deal for me right now. 
Awesome. Well, I want to wish you all the best with, you know, just creating your team. Um, and I'm sure you, you definitely are headed to the right direction. Um, just to switch up the conversation a little bit, you know, we on, on, on this call, I think we have about four or five women. So let's talk about, you know, um, how, we, you know, I think that women are grossly um, underrepresented um, in, in, in the music industry. And just to give you a few numbers, um, like there's 21% um, in the music industry in the world today, 21% are um, female and 12% are songwriters and only 2.1% are producers. So the percentages and the margins are very, very low. It still looks like a, you know, a, a, a boys club no offense to the boys, um, <laughs> still looks very much like a, like a boys club. And, um, and I, I, for me, it's like, what's happening? And what, um, what do you think uh, makes female African artists more vulnerable, uh, and, and um, just less, less accomplished, if I, if I, if I may say so, because the ones that we know are like, we can count them by our fingers. You know, we can always start by saying T-Y-M-E, see me and, 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 you know, but what do we also do to just kind of just in, in March is going to be um, women, women's month. And so how, what, how do we just make sure that, that we highlight as much women as possible in the music industry? Um, Frank, I'm going to put this to you as, a, you know, the head of a record label. Like, let's sign more women. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll say ladies first as well, once again. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Valentine. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not just throwing the ball. Sorry, I'm, it's fine. It's fine. I'm really uh, that gentle. So I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you do the talking and then I'll follow up. No, it's that, I'm, that subject is actually the one. <laughs> It's, it's really, I'm glad you're asking this question because it's really a passion point for me. I think being a, a, a manager in the music industry, I can help shift the culture and I'm making a point to do so. <laughs> so, but being a woman in the music industry is not different to being a woman in any industries. I just think overall we work twice as hard um, with, with all the responsibility, other responsibilities we have, you know, um, on top of being a mother and a, a wife and a friend, you know, so um, yeah, I think there should be more women, you know, in top management in the music industry, but there's a shift. Um, if you look at Sylvia Rome, she's the CEO of Epic Records, uh, UMG's got a good example with Eloise Kelly, who's now the CEO of Universal Africa. So it's, it's slowly shifting. Um, but going back to my point of trying to make a change from a trace perspective, we made the pledge that 50-50 will, um, in stating a 50-50 video airplay for women artists and other women produce content. So we started in South Africa um, and now we're asking all the rest of the regions to follow that lead because if a big media like us are not trying to make that shift, who else will, you know? And it's funny because we, received a lot of PR. Uh, we did a big PR campaign when we launched this in South Africa. And obviously we, have, we had a PR agency asking for time slots for me to speak about the campaign, but a lot of the mainstream radio stations refused to have us on, to have us on because you're creating now, um, I don't know, a wave for people to follow and do the same, but they're not willing to do so. But we, we, we did get a few you know, interviews. So. Yeah, it, it's, it's really a, a tough industry. Um, you know, music business isn't for, for everyone. I think, I don't know, maybe 90% of the artists go unnoticed that are really talented. But with Trace and the channel, we also have a big focus on up and coming artists. Um, we do run campaigns specifically for women, but overall, we really try to empower artists with all the marketing campaigns that we're currently doing because it's it's really our new mission um so we always tie it back to that empowerment mission okay if we run this marketing ca campaign how is it going to help the youth um and women in particular as well wow this is great this is great um i think yeah i, I mean i mean from uh from our perspective i'm, I'm part of a dni committee at, at vivendi 
um, working on diversity and inclusion. Um, and of course, it popped up during the Black Lives Matter um, movement last year and in, in the NSARS in, in, in Nigeria and everybody working on civil rights and all these civil rights move movements popping up here and there. And uh, whenever I got a, on, on that table with them guys from, from, um, from Europe and from the US, I was like, well, we, from an African perspective, we have, I mean, you guys are still working on that, but we have a tough issue with feminism and how uh, women, uh, not only in the music industry, but in our societies um, are um, given or not given the opportunities they're supposed to get. So um, everybody came in with, with, with their, their, their ideas and a lot of great women came in with um, uh, stories. And I believe in one thing, I believe in telling stories. I believe in telling stories and I think that um, if we had something, if we were to do something, is to really create a platform, a wide platform for the amazing African women, not only um, artists, I'm talking about uh, managers, I'm talking about creatives, I'm talking about um, uh, uh, marketing tech women who can just like talk about their experience and how they came from there and made it somewhere else so that they can like other younger women could visualize what they can be and what they can become so this is what we're working on at universal music africa besides trying to sign more female artists and creatives and hopefully um that's this year we'll get to uh, to create a few platforms with a, a couple of our um uh bank partners telco partners uh from cameroon from Cote d'Ivoire and create these platforms and help these women talk about their, their, their course and hopefully inspire other young women. Um, definitely. I actually have a question for you, Frank, because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the days, it was proven that female artists would generate more revenues than male artists. So why is there, is there more, why are you not signing more female artists? Then? Mm. I wouldn't like to be honest. I wouldn't know. To um, to my mind, they are. We need to we, we need to go to these talents. They're there. I know that they're there. Um, once you once you got one in your roster, then you you surely you surely and usually hit the jackpot. But we need to to find them. We need to 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 create these platforms for these female talents. To be seen, and I think that, I mean, we do have these responsibilities. I'm, I'm taking it real serious. I have two daughters myself, and ten years from now, if my daughter wants to work and be the next Charlotte, for instance, I need to be really feel comfortable with, with yeah, you can go do that, do that. <laughs> Look at that woman out there; she's doing great. You can do it. So uh, we're working on that. Frank, I'm looking forward to the platform you're creating. And I think the, the, the reason why I kind of push this question to you is because Valentine and I, from, from where we're sitting, it's, it's more of a, from a platform base. And so we kind of just work with the women that we have already that, you know, and sometimes I see a priority list from a record label or from a distributor. And it's always like this top 10 of the priority is just like male artists and like, oh, where's the, where's the female artist? number 50 maybe you, you get what i mean so you don't really have to your but but like we i'd like to see and i think i started asking a lot of record labels when i see a priority list for 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 releases on friday and i'm always asking where are the females i, I kind of just need to see the females on this top 10 list i need to see like five females on this top 10 list and and i'm looking forward to the platform that you're creating and you know I'm, I'm with you 100%, so you can hit me up on the side and we can talk no about- No pressure, no pressure, Frank. No, no pressure. Thank you, uh, But, but you, 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 know, you know, I had the same question to Charlotte Dipanda is one of our, our, our queens in, at Universal Music Africa, and she's from Cameroon. She's like one cra crazy diva from Cameroon. Um, and she's dropping her, dropping her album this week. And, and during the, the, like, thinking of the promo plan, et cetera, I was like, well, um, like, don't you want to talk about you being in a, like being in a, a woman in an African 
industry and sometimes it's not it's not that easy i believe from what she told me it's not that easy for female artists to talk about their situation in a very maleish industry so we also need us um men we also need to 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 create a space where um women don't feel uh insecure talking about their struggles talking about uh how how they have to uh go back home earlier um to take care of their kids for instance or spend more time with the kids because we do as well like it happens you, you want to go back home at four because you want to spend time with which is the daughter or, or or child. So I think I, I think that creating these platforms of expression um, and having these great women telling their stories will help us get there uh, in a quicker way. I think One, that Ladipo also wanted to. to yeah, to, um, I, I felt like we sidelined Ladipo for a minute, but he spoke about uh, the thing uh, as well. And I hope I'm going to see more women on Ladipo's team. But Ladipo, let, let, the floor is yours. Actually, until recently, my, my manager was female, you know, and it's only because of slightly different priorities in terms of what she wanted to do and what I wanted to do, if not, and we are still, you know, friends to this day. Um, so, in fact, in, at the record label, uh, the head of a &R is female, head of finance, female, uh, head of operations, HR, female. Um, there is, I think, I want to say at this point, probably about 50%, you know, in the head office, you know, so it's, that's not something, and in terms of in the music industry in Nigeria, I think it's impressive. It's impressive to see the caliber, the, the, the kind of music that is coming out of Nigeria right now. Um, and all of it, female artists are running the Thames. Thames is a great example. You know, she was on my first project in 2018. I have a song with her called Falling. And that was the first time I met her. I met her in the studio. And um, I was just told that day, oh, she sings, by the way. You know, listen to her music, pulled it to the side, like, yo, can you please hop on this record? And now she has one of the, you know, 2019, she had one of the biggest songs in the country, a song called Try Me. You know, um, Maven just dropped a female artist, Ira, in the, the last 30 days, and she's doing amazing. And I think Frank said something, though, which is, you know, it's by seeing. You know, the, the, younger, the younger artists, the ones that are right now 10 years old, 15, 16, it's what they see. They emulate what they see. I have Sydney who collaborated with me on Know You, who had a baby recently and is still, I mean, smashing it with her song, Do You Care? These are great examples. And she may not know it, but she's absolutely inspiring a generation that's coming behind her. You know, and they are seeing more of this representation, and they're becoming more empowered to take on and express themselves in the way they want, with the way they want to. Nigeria is a very patriarchal society. It's to the point where um, it really, I just can't see how the industry can, it will not go that far forward unless it starts to acknowledge this, these contributions from female artists, you know, and um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not worried because it's, it's an active thing, but at the same time, it, the music is so undeniable coming from this end that, yeah, it's, trust me, just look through. Tommy Awards on Universal, Thames, Ira, you know, it, you know, trust me, the music coming out of Nigeria is, is, is amazing from female artists, guaranteed. I mean, we see it, we, we, we definitely want, just want to see more. I'd, I'd, I'd say that, you know. I agreed. We want to see them ten times more. Yeah, we want to to see Thames headline our own concert and just not yeah. you know, performing for somebody else or or just opening as, as an opening act. So that that those are the kind of, 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 of opportunities that we really want to see for uh, the, the female artists as well. Because I think I've, I've been I've been watching and I've been seeing a lot of um, just like how the industry is working and. When you're in, in Nigeria in December, you definitely attend de different concerts, but it's always yes, you know, male and a lot of guys, a lot of guys, and I'd like to see a female headline concert. You know, one of these one of these fine days in in December, when COVID decides to free us. Um, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk to you, Ladi Paul. Let's talk about the future of rap um, and 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 just Afrobeat in its worldwide distribution. I mean. 
right now it's, it's like it's a scramble right now there's a scramble for africa there's a scramble yeah. for african music and african content yeah. uh, content and and you know props to us because we are amazing people all of us you know <laughs> you know um but i just i just i, I want to know what would you think what you envision for for the future and what you what you want to see as well um you know i found it interesting when i when i saw um rap and afrobeats put together like that. I, I like that, you know, Afrobeats is absolutely what people think of when they first think of African music. And uh, now specifically about Nigeria, rap is still some way behind in differentiating itself. Uh, I have to even say that the future envision is one where it becomes just as prominent as Afrobeats, the genre that has been termed Afrobeats rap music from Africa and Nigeria to be as prominent as that and to be diversified somehow. So those artists can have their own space and not just fit under the one umbrella of Afrobeats. That's what I would love to see, you know, because I make music that is, is very much rap based. You know, that's how I express myself. It's my medium of communication. And it's not, yes, it's on Afrobeats type music, but it's not, necessarily Rema is doing, you know what I mean? So what I would love to see is differentiation coming out a little bit more. I'm very passionate about rap music and about young rappers in particular, because a lot of them have suffered this identity crisis because they rap in, rap is popularized in America as this kind of sound. And we share this, you know, we have roots, but in Africa, I want them to understand that rap music is always going to be fusion. It's always going to be based on different sounds where melodic people, we came up listening to different things, you know, so it doesn't, it, it's okay for your rap music to be a, um, uh, on a dance hall type beat or, or an Afro beats type beat or whatever something is really a melting pot of sounds, you know, and for them to not feel that if it's not, if you don't sound like, um, um, if you don't sound like Travis Scott or Jay-Z or whoever, you're still rapping, you're still doing your thing, you know? So that's the future I want to create. And I feel like um, my kind of music and my own brand, the whole idea of me calling myself the leader of the revival is saying to them that, yo, this train that is moving out the station, the first three, four, five carriages might be Afro beats, but best believe that, yo, this other movement, this other sound is, is, is coming along with it too, you know? Um, so, and I also say this for other genres that are coming up in Nigeria because it's becoming really diverse. You know, the Altair sound, this sound and that sound, they all, they all deserve to have their own shine, their own names and their own pioneers spreading the gospel. You know, that, that's the future I see, a lot more differentiation. Of course, I'm me headlining, you know how it goes. I hear you, I, and I'm waiting for that day. I think from, from, from us as, as, a, as a platform that kind of just distributes this music for the rest of the world. We try our, our very best to kind of just highlight every other genre that there is, but also just work with partners like AfroChallenge and Afro Nation and just make sure that every artist um, that is on the platform from you know representing different genres also just get a chance to kind of perform on stage and, and um, just uh, find a new audience and introduce them to a new audience. Um, and because you're speaking about, you know, different genres, I, you know, like I said, we, Congo, is, there's uh, what's called Coupe de Cale or Lingala, um, Ghana, there's a zone to um, Nigeria, like you say, there's Afro beats, but, you know, when there's also, well, I don't know what they call the sound that is Latin does. Um, uh, Zanku. Yes, there's Zanku, Zanku. music. It's like, even yeah. within, there's different, I think South Africa has Kwaito, but has, home and has um, um i'm a piano as well which is doing so mm, amazing i'm a piano um, wow yeah it's this it's well like i recently had k star remix with david and i was like oh that's 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 a sound um but um i, I think we, we definitely need to to diversify and showcase um every other genre a collaboration and, collaboration. Yeah, collaboration. And that's one thing that i was going to point out so um, when you see Davido jumping on an Ama piano song, and we see a lot of Nigerian um, artists putting out a lot of Ama piano right now, because um, it's a it's a really dope sound. So, yeah, um, 
um, I think Frank, could you talk us more into just like kind of highlighting, making sure that we can also highlight Francophone artists in in um, in Nigeria or in South Africa or in Kenya, for example, just like we can highlight Swahili artists and highlight Diamond Platinums and just get Diamond Platinums music playing in Nigeria. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as uh, the depot said, uh, it's I think it's a process. I think it's a process. Um, diversification um, and these genres that were supposed to be like that were niche, it's been niche first, and then it became these genres became popular. I'm talking about the hip hop movements, and and in the U.S. they went through that right. Now it crossed over, and now uh, it's over here. And when when African rappers started rapping, it was niche. Not a lot of people will listen to to to, to hip hop. For instance, I'm talking about hip hop strictly. Then we'll jump to 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 the others to the other genres. But but now you have a hip hop artists concerts with families going to these concerts. So it's not just niche. It's 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 like becoming popular now. As you said, um, Ladipo, uh, we, we we're, we're still under the Afro beats umbrella. To be honest, I mean they just though everything that sound boom, cha, cha, boom, cha, cha, and then the, the, the Afro beat sound. So, but it's not just Afro beat. There's Alte, there's a piano, there's a Zanku, Coupe de Calais, the Roomba. It's not just that, but these, these niche audiences are going to be more and more massive, I believe. And we as producers and creators need to, to to, to push for that. And I think that it's only, it's only going to be natural. The collaborations will help. Collaborations between, between different genres will help. Um, but it's also the nature of things. It's going to take a time. It's a process. It's a natural process to my mind. We're heading there. Uh, 10, years from, 10, years, uh, 10 years before, I don't think that we would have been able to talk about a Dev Jam Africa, for instance, because like Dev Jam is like the mecca of hip hop. So what the heck does he have to do with African Afro beats? It's not now. Now there's a hip hop movement. There's dope, there's strong, there's popular. So we deserve a house of hip hop. We deserve our Dev Jam and our Dev Jam doesn't necessarily sound like their Dev Jam. It doesn't sound like Russell Simmons Dev Jam, but we do have the codes. We know about the movement. We, 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 we're about the culture. So this is what we stand for. And I think that every single genre is we head there. It's a, it's a process, it's just a process to my mind. I mean, we look forward to that day. Valentina, I, I did want to mention this, like, I, and, and you know, I, I see Trace and sometimes I see Trace Muziki and I see like fragment, fragments and, and, and stuff like that. But do these fragmentations, do they play genres from other countries and other, other you know, just represent other genres as well. Because when it's called Tres Muziki, is it only like Swahili music or East African music? Or yeah. So I think when we first launched on the continent with our partner DSTV in two thousand and seven, it was only one feed for the continent. Uh, but as you know, and as we've spoken about, there's lots of different subgenres, different cultures, different languages. So. The strategy for for trace and i think that's the number one reason why we're so successful now is that we've localized the different feeds um so for inside Af we've got three different feeds for southern africa i think for the continent we've got 13 different feeds that cater the needs of the different regions so in francophone africa, africa we've got three different feeds east africa there's now mziki that's the channel you see in, in kenya and eastern africa you've got a we've got a dedicated channel for ethiopia that's got its very own specific sound for instance um, but with that being said we also wanted to create bridges between those different regions because how do artists make money now it's also by touring so we want to make sure through the channels that we expose them to other regions so we have created a show called juba which is the top 30 songs uh, on the continent. So it's got Francophone artists, it's got Lusophone artists and Anglophone artists. And that show is being broadcasted all over the world, not just on the continent, because we're really trying to export those artists 
to the UK, to France, and you know, all over the world. So, and I, I, for me, I think the the power and the influence of African music will be unavoidable at some stage. I think we are consuming music more than ever before from a wider range of sources. And it's now from the click of a button, you have, you're exposed to like a whole new world, you know, no matter where you are in the world. So what I'd like to see though, is more locally produced sound and vibe. So you've, we've talked about Afrobeat has been popularized by the Nigerians. And it's so funny because on Trace Africa, as soon as people hear Afrobeat, they assume it's a Nigerian song. So when we first launched the channel, we used to get a lot of complaints saying, ah, but you only play Nigerian music. So what we've done is now you have the name of the country throughout the music video so that people could see that there's music from all over, Cameroon, Botswana, South Africa, so all over, just to try and educate people as well. Afrobeat is not <laughs> always a Nigerian song, you know? Um, and I feel that's, that's what's missing from a couple of markets on the continent, you know, like uh, like a Kenya, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe, I'm, maybe you need to educate me, Charlotte, in terms of like an original song sound that's coming from East Africa, that's been popularized in the rest of the continent. I'm yet to see that. Um, and I agree, for, I think artists locally should also focus on collaborating with artists on the continent first without trying to shoot for like international collaboration that will, for me, they will come afterwards naturally. And we see a lot more of these now. Um, local artists who are trying to make uh, a name for themselves in the different regions of the continent. So another example, um, South East Soul, I think the latest album, they've done a collaboration with a big artist from the main different regions on the continent. And that for me, that's a really clever strategy. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of artists should be, you know, sh should follow that as well, because then from a trace perspective, it means I can put that song on potentially five or six, six different channels, because the song resonates with like three different markets, for instance. So yeah, <laughs> it's like, hey, I see you. <laughs> um, I think our, our from this conversation, a rather challenging question I have for you guys is, what do you think the next big wave from Africa is? And not thinking about Afrobeat, the other upcoming genres. Ladipo, what do you think the next big wave is? Um, you know, that's, I find it to be an interesting question, you know, but first off, they'll probably still call it Afrobeats, no, no matter what the wave is. You know, that's just the name is just has caught on so strongly. But that said, um, I think that at the end of the day, the sounds that are coming from Africa are, are the next big world sound. I don't even think the world has even, the tip of the iceberg is all, the, all they've heard. Because what is interesting is that there's a whole generation of, people, children across the world who are growing up with Afrobeats music or African music as their popular music. So I can't even imagine what this generation is now going to pr produce. And I'm talking about people in, in America, people in, 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 in Europe, people in Australia. They are 15, 16, 10, 11 years old listening to mainstream African music they're going to grow up knowing that that is a sound, you know, and they're going to, their collaborations are going to be even, make the collaborations even more effortless. So I can't say what the next big sound is that's going to come up from this region, but I do know that there is going to be something because we are that creative and, and it's going to be exciting times. And I look forward to collaborating with these artists so I can be on as many channels as possible. And big shout out to Trace because, you know, they really showed one of my songs, my, my song, Know You, a lot of love. It was on different types of, their channels and, and that was really special. It took the song because people wanted to hear it and, and, and it's just great to know that this stuff is possible, right? So I don't know what the next sound is. I don't know the name. It's probably gonna have some kind of interesting name, like, but it's gonna be from here. It's gonna be, uh, you know, our continent. Frank, I see you and we are on our last, um, on our last question really, which is, you know, the next wave, what you think the next wave is gonna be but also just any advice that you have for any upcoming creatives, um, songwriters, producers, 
in, in, in the African um, music industry as well. So yeah, that's uh, those are our last questions, which will also go to Valentin. Yeah, um, to 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 try to make it make it quick. I'm I'm into I'm into what uh, my brothers from from Congo are doing right now. I love the Afro Congo sound from uh, from a lot of it's like uh, Inos B, for for instance, who actually mixes your typical Afro beats with uh, some coupe de calais rhythms and your typical rumba so like it became something really like a fusion of west african music um um coupe de calais was something and we lost dj afat and it just broke and i'm i'm really curious um about what, what will come after that because he left like a hole so someone will come and shift the whole thing and and i'm hearing stuff right now that is really really interesting as far as the um, the advice or a couple of words for for african artists i'll tell them to be passionate be passionate about what they do um be reactive patience be reactive because like this new normal is pushing us to really focus on what we have instead of um, what we're looking into in the next 20, 25 years, collaborate more with the people that are next to us because our market is really wealthy with talent. Um, and then be proud, be proud because we are different, uh, different from what mainstream music has been for a lot of people for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And be proud of that difference. And once you're proud of that difference, you work with the talents and the environment that's right around you, that, that's right next to you, which is already something huge and very powerful. So those, those will be my last words. <laughs> yeah, be Black and be proud, be African. Valentin? <laughs> I think I will stay on my collaboration spirit. So what I would like to see maybe is a fusion of sound that are popular in the different regions. Um, you know, like uh, Kuduro from Angola with an ama piano, you know, so that the sound is, can travel a lot easier and not just be specific to a country. Uh, because there's some music and uh, I'm not gonna give any example, I don't want to make any enemies, but like, in some specific countries, the sound is not made for like a South African audience, you know, but if there's a collaboration and a fusion, then that make it a lot more exportable. So I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot of those. It's a really tough question. I, I mean, I'm a piano came from like Pretoria here in South Africa, and now it's just like, it's, it's, it's like a, a continental movement. It's a hit in Eastern Africa. It's a hit in Nigeria. And soon the Nigerians are going to claim it that it's coming from Nigeria. You know, I'm watching this face, but no, I don't know what's coming next. But my personal point of view is I really want to see more fusion between the sounds. All right, ladies and gentlemen, sadly, we have come to the end of this very interesting discussion. And I just want to say a big thank you to you guys, Valentin, Frank, um, Ladi Paul. Um, fortunately or unfortunately for you, that we have another mm -hmm. episode, you know, <laughs> the next episode of WAVE, we will be looking at the rather unknown African alternative music scene. So we will be talking more, um, less about Afrobeat, more about Alte sounds and, yes. and everything. And we hope um, that you will join us for that. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Wave. Found out more about the series on our social media accounts. We are the wave, we reaching out to the skies. Africa rising, moving like on its skies. We are the wave, we tell the stories of life. We tell the stories of life.